um, this is the advanced panel. In parentheses, um, we're going to try um, to give a worthwhile introduction into what the blockchain actually is, what the flavors of blockchains are out there, what the differences are, um, what the brand names are, everybody's talking about what's behind that. I would be happy if um, we could somehow manage to have as much input from you guys as possible to direct um, the direction that we're talking uh, into. Um, and I would like uh, to give everybody here on the panel the chance to introduce themselves first. Uh, Dominic, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Dominic. I'm an entrepreneur, engineer, and researcher. My research interest is in scalable crypto ledgers, and my business interest is in uh, political finance. It's just a little bit quiet. <laughs> Did anybody not hear it? I mean, it's carrying quite well here. Could you repeat it? No. Okay. You're good. Excellent. I'm Peter Todd. I uh, do Bitcoin Core development and uh, I'm quite interested in scalability and privacy issues. And to pay the bills, I do uh, consulting for Bitcoin and fintech in general. I'm Henning Dietrich. I'm working at IBM. And uh, in the moment, I'm working in a group that is using the blockchain to enable markets between devices in the Internet of Things area. And uh, that's been just presented and it's been a huge success, as it seems. So. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy to be um, part of that going forward there and uh, seeing how the blockchain is actually finding tractions uh, within big companies. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Mickeljohn. I'm a lecturer at University College London. Um, so I'm an academic. My background is in cryptography and computer security um, with a focus really on privacy. And I've been looking into Bitcoin and blockchains in general um, for the past few years. I am Vlad. I'm a researcher at the Ethereum project. Um, I work on blockchain architecture and I'm primarily interested in public blockchains uh, to serve as like platforms and public utilities and to have this kind of trustless, trustless nature that isn't quite possible in private blockchains. Okay, thank you. So I would like to ask Peter, who is kind of the Bitcoin guy in this, uh, in this group, uh, to describe a little bit about what Bitcoin is and what makes it special compared to other blockchains out there? Well, I think the main thing to go point out is no one in particular runs Bitcoin. You know, and what that really means is it's not clear how to go shut down Bitcoin. It's not really clear also how to go change Bitcoin often. Whereas if you go beyond that to the actual technology, Actual technology of Bitcoin looks very similar to a whole bunch of other um, systems like it in this blockchain space. Um, as an example, in the fintech kind of world, a lot of people are talking about permissioned blockchains and so on. And they're essentially Bitcoin, but with a defined group of people running them. And then when you go down to that, well, I mean, people often say, you know, why use a blockchain? Why not use a database? Well, for the people in this room who understand databases, well, I'll point out, you know, Essentially, uh, regardless whether it's Bitcoin or one of these permission systems or so on, all this stuff is basically just a strong cryptographically uh, signed, cryptographically auditable transaction log for what a database's state should be. And if you can do something with the database, you can probably go do something with the blockchain. Whether or not it's a good idea is another matter, but you know, I think that kind of summarizes that fairly well. So what you just said in the end, that's not just Bitcoin. That's blockchain in general, right? Absolutely. So... Would you like to say something about Bitcoin or Ethereum? Um, I just want to say something about distributed databases versus blockchains. Okay, no. Uh, I would like you to... Henning, come on. No, <laughs> we can do that later, maybe. I would like you to um, make the point what Ethereum is uh, as opposed to Bitcoin and why it's so much better. So, <laughs> so at the moment, Ethereum has... I know what he's going to say. I'm impartial, of course. So at the moment, Ethereum has the same kind of consensus protocol as Bitcoin, um, but Ethereum has uh, like the state that the consensus is keeping track of is a database of accounts that have code in a virtual machine that's turning complete, so application developers can write in a high-level language uh, that's relatively familiar to them and then compile it down into code that runs on the blockchain. So basically, it's just easier for application developers to make blockchain applications on Ethereum than on Bitcoin. And that's um, 
probably the main the main important difference. Can I can I ask you because you couldn't you're looking so confused, but um, I, can I try to maybe synthesize that in a less technical way? Yeah, please. Um, so basically, Bitcoin is a very specific application. In this, uh, you can do really one type of one type of entry can be stored. It's the transfer of bitcoins from one party in the system to another. And Ethereum, um, as Vlad said, is Turing complete, which basically means you can do arbitrary um, types of transactions. So for example, um, you can transfer the deed to a house, or you can really do any type of computation. Um, as opposed, sorry? Um, so Ethereum is sort of strictly more general than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, I can transfer this many coins from party A to party B. Um, it is sort of strictly intentionally limited in that sense. Ethereum is sort of, you know, arbitrary types of transactions. And I mean, beyond finance as well. And would, would you say you can do smart contracts on Bitcoin at all? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean... What type of smart contracts do you have? Like? Uh, so, you can do, for example, the automated, you know, you can use end lock time, right, to say that after this many, after this unit of time, these funds could automatically be transferred or this could automatically be, be released in this way. So, you called it Turing complete and you said it has more, what? It accommodates different payloads, but I think um, my understanding, at least of it, is uh, it is a superset over what Bitcoin can do. Right, it's not just different. More general. Yeah. So, yeah, awesome. That's so, <laughs> no, it's it's, uh, it's it's okay if we say say things once or twice here. Um, what what do you think is is the the threshold where you say okay, you cannot? That, that's things that you cannot do with Bitcoin. Can I get can I get this? Please. Um, so what you can't do with Bitcoin is have outputs carry uh, so inputs carry state to the outputs, um, and you can't have outputs sending messages to other outputs. So um, sorry, do you want to translate that again? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the kind of smart contracts that you have in Bitcoin are not stateful, and they can't talk to each other. Okay, um, question to the audience. Who <laughs> here feels like stateful makes sense? I'm, I'm coming to you okay, in a second. Who here, who here understands what stateful would mean or doesn't feel like completely lost? That's pretty good. That's good, but we want to take everybody on board. Um, Steve Manstrom. <laughs> You're trying to make our audience leave or what's the idea? <laughs> so, Dominic, um, what, what else is out there and what, what's missing with Ethereum and Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, firstly, I think it's worth clarifying the distinction between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So both of them are state machines, and the state goes from um, A to B according to rules um, as uh, transformed by transactions. Um, and the difference is that Bitcoin, uh, in, in Bitcoin, the state machine just moves Bitcoins between different addresses. And in Ethereum, um, you store software objects uh, on the chain. Um, they themselves update themselves. Through a transaction, in, in the real world. Maybe I think I'll, I'll, I'll give this a shot. So, <laughs> you know, if you look at a standard database, I mean, well, what's a database? It's this tool for managing a set of data. And the trivial examples you'll see in textbooks on databases are things like, you know, all the customers of your business. And do the database will let you look up, all right, what's the customer name, what's his address, you know, collect various bits of data together. The key thing is, Databases, as they get used, there's no clear transaction log in you know in most implementations of why the change is. Now, if all that really matters, um, if all we're, we're talking about is, for instance, what's a customer's address, usually in most businesses, if it's not really clear who the heck actually entered in that customer's address, for instance, if that's not very important, if that's not something that often comes up as a question, databases work great. What blockchains do is they add very strong uh, capabilities of logging why the state of the database is what it is, you know. And when it comes to money, it's very, very important to know, well, yes, who has what money is nice, but we want to know why they have it. Because an obvious thing to do is steal someone's money by putting in entries into the database or trading money out of thin air. And because Bitcoin and Ethereum and systems like it have very, very strong transaction logs, they can audit and verify as to why the database is what it is, that's the advantage. Whereas if you then look at, say, Bitcoin versus Ethereum, 
Well, if you want to do the heavy lifting yourself of going through that big chunk of data and running your computation that you need for your business reasons, both systems can do the same thing. Both systems can run your own logic. But in Ethereum, because it's string complete, because other people run this very complex, uh, very capable, very general language, I can trust someone else to go and do the heavy lifting of running my calculations. And because so many other computers check it, in theory, I can trust the results of that calculation. Whereas in Bitcoin, the only calculation it can do is who is what Bitcoin. So how would you describe that, be, being more concrete or with an example, what the heavy lifting would be in a concrete case with a concrete transaction or contract? Well, as an example, um, if I wanted to do a calculation for, say, a bond, um, you know, how much is a bond worth, who deserves what, um, uh, what coupons from the bond or so on, I just can't do that on Bitcoin because the protocol doesn't have any understanding of bonds. Whereas in Ethereum, in theory, because it is a language attached, I could write a smart contract that does that calculation, let the Ethereum network run that smart contract, and if I trust the Ethereum network, then I can trust whatever result came out of that without having to do all that um, computation myself. Okay, cool. I would like to give you the chance to talk about a little bit what you're researching, which is going beyond um, and is making a difference to what exists right now uh, out there now. Hi, um, I use uh, Ethereum just as a giant distributed virtual machine. Each smart contract is a kind of software object or a process that is updated according to the rules in the software logic. You don't have to trust that software, software logic will be executed correctly. And um, you know, each transaction that's sent to um, the Ethereum blockchain is really a, a method call on one of these software objects. And so, you know, clearly many more things are possible um, than with Bitcoin, because we now have a distributed virtual machine we can run processes on, which have a consistent state maintained on the blockchain itself. Um, so, um, you know, looking forward from where we are now, one might imagine that uh, we have scalable uh, decentralized virtual machines that can run any number of processes. And once we have that, um, all kinds of uh, things beyond the current smart contract, the current applications of the Ethereum blockchain can actually become possible. So uh, one might imagine that a open uh, version of Facebook will run soon. Uh, you probably know what that is. D Facebook, D LinkedIn, D Twitter, D Gmail, D Search, right? So, um, and the reason people would want to use these decentralized services rather than centralized services is that they're open. Um, anyone can print out the code, the data is freely available, and no capricious um, owner of the service can suddenly decide that they want to restrict other people's access to the data and make them pay for it. Um, so the question is, you know, that's, that's I, I think you know, if you look forward, you know, 10, 20 years, that's where it's going. You know, we've had open source, we've had open source software for a while, we've had open source operating systems, and we're gonna have uh, an open source decentralized virtual machine. You know, this kind of technology will do for uh, computation what Bitcoin did for file sharing. Okay, and Dominic, uh, one question about uh, to, to go beyond what we have with Bitcoin and Ethereum at this point. Could you pick another chain, another household name, meanwhile, for example, Ripple, and describe what it can do and what the differences are to, towards... It's okay. This is a pr provocative question. So, I mean, Ripple, Ripple <laughs> is really... A, in my view, a decentralized virtual machine, right? I mean, it runs on, you know, the last count, I think, three trillion Ethereum nodes, right? And so it's a very different kind of thing, and they, they're really trying to re-architect the blockchain system in a number of different ways. So it's got a different type of approach. And they also control all of the cryptocurrency that is available on the chain. So um, that's really contrasts quite strongly with something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, which is spread over thousands. Peter, you have another um, chain you would like to well, describe. I would go point out that there's two versions of Ripple that we could talk about. One is the Ripple Labs Ripple that's actually made by Ripple Labs, which that was a great description there. The other version of Ripple is the original Ripple concept, which uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Hawala, is essentially a digital Hawala. And what's interesting about that is it specifically does not need global consensus. 
in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many of these other systems, we have this assumption that every single person in the world who participates fully in the system knows the entire state of the system. And in Hawala, the person-to-person -person money transfer network, I mean, obviously that's not true because as Hawala works, we have family members calling each other up saying, you know, could you go and make sure this money eventually gets to this guy off in this country? Well, they're literally using phone calls. So obviously they don't have global consensus. They don't know what the state of other Hawala transfers. Ripple, the original concept, was just like that, but with computers, where from one computer to another, if I'm running my computer with a Ripple client, and I trust someone else who I know running another computer with a Ripple client, they can talk to each other digitally and negotiate money transfers between each other. Do you have any insight in why this was given up as a, as a basic idea? Was it not possible to make that work with computers? Well, it's very easy to do. It's just, how do you commercialize it? I mean, it's just peer-to-peer -peer software. Whereas the Ripple Labs Ripple, part of the business model was to have this token. The problem is the moment you have a token that you need to do transactions, suddenly you need to have a central database of who owns. So you, 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 couldn't have a, you couldn't have a, a sale uh, with uh, Hawala? You cannot have a sale without global yeah. consensus because you don't know who owns exactly. the token. It's also not trustless, right? A pre-sale, that's yeah, what I mean. You've got to trust the parties that you're transacting through, even, even though you're doing a transaction. You've got, to tr you've got to trust whoever your balance ends up being held with. with yes, money. although remember, yeah. Ripple, the existing system, you still have to go trust the parties. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, um, I would like you to explain one of the altcoins, as it's often called. Uh, sure. So I guess I'll pick uh, Stellar, which I kind of view as a somewhat nicer version of Ripple. Um, maybe also a provocative statement. Um, so one thing I'm really interested in right now is... You know, I look at systems like Bitcoin and Ethereum as sort of very powerful and requiring really minimal trust assumptions, but um, with that coming at a cost, right? And um, we're sort of seeing some of these costs emerge. And I think uh, personally that there are a lot of settings where this sort of full trustlessness is not entirely necessary, right? So a friend and I sort of compare the setting of Bitcoin and Ethereum to being like in the Hunger Games. I mean, you really don't want to trust anyone. Everyone's out to get you. You know, you can't even form factions. And that's fine. Um, maybe you feel that way. But, you know, there are probably settings in which we might be willing to trust someone. Um, so, for example, something I've done recently is work with um, the Bank of England, right? So maybe you trust the central bank. Uh, maybe you don't. I, it's not for me to say. So Stellar is also something that sits somewhere in the middle. And in Stellar, um, we're basic, the consensus protocol is now just not this collection of sort of mutually distrustful people. But this is saying that actually a transaction can go through as long as you and I agree on anyone that we trust mutually. Um, so if you and I are, there's no one in common that we can agree on, then uh, that makes things very difficult. But if there's some sort of set of uh, participants, um, then we can actually sort of uh, achieve this sort of mythical notion of consensus. Um, and so I think sort of exploring this uh, sort of space in the middle where maybe we are willing to relax um, and trust people a bit or trust some set of people um, is sort of one of my main interests. Thanks. Vitale, um, sorry, Vlad, same question. <laughs> sure, so um, I'm interested in actually public blockchains, one that are very much in this adversarial environment. So I guess I'll talk about like Tendermint and Casper, basically um, kind of proof of stake based uh, blockchains. Um, the idea is that well, you know this kind of security in this low trust environment does come at a price, and what we want to do is make that price as kind of low as possible. In a proof of work model, uh, every the network needs to constantly spend more money than an adversary might at any time to create blocks. Um, in this kind of new security deposit based proof of stake model, which is like a Tendermint and Casper, um, the model is that it should be kind of cheap for everyone except for an adversary during an attack. So with that kind of a model, um, the price that you pay for a consensus is dramatically lower. Uh, and so, you know, I actually think that public consensus uh, in this trustless environment is very valuable for certain kinds of infrastructure, uh, namely like global infrastructure that everyone relies on. Um, and so I, I'm interested in making public 
consensus protocols more efficient and um, you know secure in that context. So where can you can you specifically say what Tendermint and Casper do? I, mean, I understand you were describing that proof of stake mm -hmm. approach, but mm -hmm. how is Tendermint different from Ethereum? Sure. So I mean, um, Tendermint is a security deposit based proof of stake consensus protocol that uh, is based on a traditional consensus protocol. It doesn't um, have forking like a normal blockchain would. Every block is created only after um, kind of a supermajority of the, the bonded stake agrees. So that would mean that is better for financial um, for the financial industry, for example, because you don't have a split stake. Um, so it certainly for, for for doing delivery of financial assets and clearing and stuff like that, you definitely want to have finality. Um, but you know you can have blockchains that where some reversion is possible and you can still have finality. But certainly uh, proof of work uh, can't finalize transactions in this sense. So how are Casper and Tendermint different? So Casper um, favors availability rather than consistency in the event of network partitions, which is to say that um, in Casper you can you have forking because people are allowed to make blocks before getting uh, messages from everyone to say that they agree. Uh, in Tendermint there isn't forking. Uh, and the trade-offs are kind of that uh, it's a little bit uh, the economics are different because you don't require permission from this larger set of nodes. And if there are partitions, if nodes go offline, um, Casper will produce non-finalized blocks, whereas Tendermint won't produce blocks at all. Would you describe both Tendermint and Casper as variations of Ethereum as we know it now? Um, so I would say that you know Ethereum primarily is uh, the kind of virtual machine, smart contract environment, rather than a consensus protocol. I think that Tendermint and Casper are kind of uh, perpendicular to Ethereum in that sense, but both Tendermint and Casper, the plan is that you know we're going to have the EVM. Um, I'm not sure exactly if uh, I think Tendermint has an option for the EVM, and Casper is is a planned hard fork of Ethereum. Okay, there was a question in the audience. If you can mem rem can remember your question, or if you have any new questions, happy to ask. Yeah, please. Sorry, uh, the power to run Bitcoin. Um, in today's money, if you were to authenticate a transaction, say under a thousand dollars, what is the reasonable cost of authenticating that transaction? Not in bitcoins and not in ripples, but in in dollars. So the question is, what is the actual cost to the world of a single transaction in, in, in Bitcoin? Or in, what is in, my in, cost if I send a hundred thousand dollars through Bitcoin? Well, no, no. Let's uh, talk about an arbitrary transaction, um, a, a transfer of ownership of something. Um, there is a cost to authenticate the transaction. In real dollars, what is that cost? You want to answer that? So, so I've heard um, this is, I think, a really interesting question. I mean, as more platforms emerge, um, it becomes sort of clear which platforms are most suitable. So I've heard that, for example, with uh, Counterparty, which is essentially sort of an overlay on top of Bitcoin, um, the cost is eight cents or something like that. Um, and so basically using it for everyday transactions, using it for things like micropayments um, is, is probably not the best idea, right? It's more suitable for sort of assets being held um, and transferred much less frequently. Um, I don't know any of the numbers for the other platforms, but I think it, this is like maybe something that I, maybe, be maybe I could talk okay. a bit about where does this cost come from, which is in the sort of proof of stake or permission environment, particularly permission environment, costs are a very strange thing because actual cost to go and check the computational, you know, check the cryptog um, cryptography signatures and so on is essentially zero. You know, I can run the entire Bitcoin blockchain that is verified the entire Bitcoin blockchain on a $20 Raspberry Pi. You know, the, the, that part of it is trivial, absolutely trivial. The really hard part is determining which version of history is the real one. Now, if I can go trust someone to always go and sign off on something and sign off exactly once on one version of history, you know, whatever the heck they're charging for that, that is my cost. The problem is we don't really have trustworthy institutions, in particular because even though we may trust an inst institution as an institution, it still may screw up. You know, as an example, banks, for instance, who have, say, permission chain, it's quite possible to have a scenario where, say, the three banks in control of this chain, their computers get hacked, someone steals the private keys, so and now there are two divergent copies. What is the actual cost to transfer $100,000 from using Bitcoin? 
every single one of these things is essentially zero, and it doesn't have anything to do with the transaction itself. So what is the cost yeah, like, of the... Like, hang, on, hang, sure. hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, let me, let, hang on, let me, let me just, let, sorry, let me explain something another way. So the thing is, it is not the cost of an individual transaction. Rather, if you take the cost of the entire system and then divide it by the number of transactions, however the heck many people use it, that's what the cost is. You know, it's infrastructure. And the cost of that infrastructure is however much, you know, whatever is the biggest attacker out there. Now, currently, the numbers happen to work out to be about eight cents, but that's not an inherent property of the system. Right, but there is a necessary incentive structure. Guys, you're both wrong. It's, it's eight dollars. So if you divide, <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> basically, um, decentralized systems uh, in the public domain, public ledgers have to defend against something known as a civil attack. They have fault tolerance assumptions built into them. Um, in Bitcoin, although it claims it can stand about a half, of, half the distance being faulty, it's about a third. And in order to prevent um, an adversary gaining a, th a third, you have to make it expensive to participate, right? And that's why you have this doctrine of uh, hashing, which is basically equates to the amount of electricity you're burning through these chips. So when you're saying eight dollars, you're you're basically dividing the entire volume of transfers by hundred thousand dollars, and then you know, I'm I'm dividing the cost, the cost of right. running the Bitcoin network so you're in terms at the of electricity cost of the world by the number of transactions, and it's eight dollars per transaction. Okay, that's cool. the underlying cost of the at Bitcoin current volume. If Bitcoin volume doubles, <laughs> that cost is actually probably halves. That's so, the weird thing no, about well, it. So you have to agree. It's, it's there, at current yeah. volume, the cost is $8. Yes, dollars, yes. Not that, that, that's why I gave my expl explanation first saying the inherent cost is essentially zero. The problem is just how does the adoption work? And it's very hard to predict. The, so, so Bitcoin was designed um, actually seven years ago now. It was a kind Can of you point that time. microphone to your mouth? So Bitcoin was designed seven years ago. Uh, it was a kind of very simple prototype. and it. There, there are several um, requirements that you have to address when designing a decentralized system. One is a, particularly a public one. One is civil resistance. Another one is consensus on what you're agreeing. Another one is validation on the data you're agreeing. And the other one is storage. And the Bitcoin blockchain combines these four different elements, civil resistance, consensus, validation, and storage. And it, because of this, it lacks some security properties, which means that it has to maintain this huge hash rate to be secure. And that's why, um, for the foreseeable future, transactions will, will cost a lot of money. Yeah, the how's, this, how's the cost then? Yeah, it's, 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 the yeah, it's hidden from the user. How's the cost then proof of stake models? Like, sorry, I'm, I'm going to talk about something else, Henning. Um, no, sorry. What, 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 you what, can't. Uh, yeah, it's can. not the rules. Uh, so, uh, Vlad, can wait, you please Henning, answer please. what no, I'm I want. I want to talk about the cost of transactions in legacy institutions. Let's do that. And please just try to answer what I'm asking. I will, maybe later. Uh, the, 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 impor the, the, the important thing to kind of realize is that the, the price of the transaction isn't the price of processing it, but the price of the trust system around it. And in legacy institutions, it's not the price of like securing against a civil attack. It's the price of compliance with rules that require that um, you do reporting, that you do reversion of fraudulent transactions, that you do like basic consumer protection stuff. There's all sorts of costs that aren't for processing the transactions, but for providing the trust and the guarantees to consumers that are required. Yeah, I'm transactions. absolutely curious what it costs on Casper to transfer $100,000. Well, um, there's a market for transaction fees, and the transaction fees are the only cost to consensus. What's the magnitude? Um, it depends on the demand for transactions. If Ethereum, if that is not true, the cost Ethereum, of capital and the stake. If Ethereum was running the, the, Casper the, the, right the, the, now, the, 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 transactions, the, cost the, the transaction fees are exactly equal to the cost of capital. Okay. Because you know, so okay. if, if Ethereum was running Casper right now in the main net, what would be the cost of a transaction of a hundred thousand um, dollars at current uh, transaction volumes? I don't know, a couple of cents probably. Sarah, what do you think? I think it's uh, obviously a hard question, um, and it's a bit of a moving target as well. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're kind of deriving the formula um, up here, but. Yeah, the truth is that basically it, the cost is whatever is needed to incentivize the people sealing the transactions into the ledger to do their job. And in different systems, uh, that might currently be different. Um, in future systems, it might be different. But I mean, the fact remains that is sort of the inherent cost is uh, paying these people who are sort of curating this ledger. And so I, how does that work? That Dominique tells us it's actually $8, but what you pay if you transfer... <laughs> Yeah, can, I, can I just ask things? So it, it's, it, it's not just about the cost of processing transactions. It's about the cost of 
preventing an adversary buying a stake in the network and then controlling it. Yeah, I think so you, you explained that quite well. But yeah. let me ask, so you, what, you how is that going yeah. together? That you have eight dollars on the one hand, and then you have like five cents. Uh, that might be the actual minor, uh, the transaction cost. So how is that working out with incentive um, structures right now? I'm sorry, I don't think it's eight dollars. I definitely think it's eight cents. Um, <laughs> We should, we, so the question is, what, what are we taking into the equation of, of this question of what is the cost? I think, I mean, really, naively, I, I would have thought uh, the actual question might be, what does it cost me if I want to transfer $100,000? And um, the person asking the question is nodding. So, yes, so, um, so just not Interestingly, we should be able, though, to, to have a magnitude, right? So you say $0.08, cents, you say $8. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 this this okay. is kind of like trying to ask, what is the cost of providing police services to go keep the people in this conference room right now safe. I but mean, I could go take like the number of seconds times the number of people here and divide it by the cost of this trillion global, you know, state police budget. But you know, this it's an overhead. It's not gloss, a marginal cost. Yeah, we I mean, shouldn't gloss clear. over we shouldn't gloss over design choices because we think that it's expensive to have police. I mean Bitcoin has semi dedicated coal fired power stations in in in, in Mongolia. All right. So that is the physical manifestation of the cost of I'm just saying the key thing here is that these costs are overheads for the entire system. They do not necessarily scale with the number of transactions. Similarly, in a proof of stake system, you have all this money tied up doing nothing other than signing trend, you know, signing blocks. So that's actually still an economic cost. It's money, you know, it's capital that's being tied up and doing nothing. In okay. both cases, you can do it. In, Calculation of what's overhead cost. I think it's point, the point is taken. And so, um, Vlad, um, do you want to say something that you couldn't say earlier? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so, I want to talk about this whole blockchains versus distributed database thing. Um, it's good to note that like distributed databases are not necessarily consensus protocols, and blockchains are necessarily consensus protocols. A consensus protocol is like something that replicates the state of this like database or state machine across multiple computers. A distributed database just kind of splits up the storage between computers. So the actual use case of a distributed database is different from the use case of a consensus protocol. Um, you know, if you want the most reliable, scalable system in the world, you want a distributed database that also has redundant copies of each of the shards of the database. So they're kind of independent properties. So uh, what what is your? You, um, you told me that in your ex, in your um, professional experience, and lots of people coming to you. Um, who want to do something with blockchain, and then you realize maybe it's not blockchain in the first place what they need. Ah, it's the percentage of that. Uh, <laughs> I'd say it's probably everyone, um, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think there's, um, yeah, so there's all these properties that Bitcoin uh, blockchains provide, right? So there's this transparency and auditability, I think we've gone into a lot of them, right? There's the notion that transactions are authenticated. Um, and it turns out that unless you really need this sort of magical combination of all of these things, um, there are other ways of achieving these properties. I mean, in particular, if you're willing to relax these trust assumptions in the way that I was saying, and if you are willing to place trust in anyone other than yourself. So you're saying no one that comes to you actually needs a blockchain? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so um, I've run a distributed database with millions of users before, and it was very useful. It was a thing called Cassandra. It had a gossip network, a bit like Bitcoin, and you could um, configure servers to join the gossip network and in, uh, expand your transaction um, processing capacity and storage capacity, too. Um, uh, but there are definitely reasons why you'd actually want to have a decentralized or you know blockchain-like distributed database. Um, for a start, it would be Byzantine fault tolerance. So if you had, a, for example, a very large organization, you can imagine a decentralized database covering hundreds of servers, and some hacker got into your network uh, and compromised a whole lot of these machines. You know, Because of the Byzantine fault tolerance properties, your database would continue running. Furthermore, you could distribute your data across those um, different servers. And uh, using uh, some kind of encryption like MPC, 
you would ensure that the hacker couldn't just download all your data and um, start selling it on 4chan. So I think there are you know, good reasons why um, decentralized databases will exist in the enterprise. So decentralization, decentralized technology isn't just for public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. It'll, it'll also be used, for example, in settlement and clearing. I mean, we've got a billion dollars almost in, in, in capital value now created by settlement and clearing companies, which are just making um, the financial uh, industry more efficient by removing intermediaries and middlemen. And within the enterprise, too, we're going to see decentralized architectures that make their infrastructure more robust and their data more secure. So, so, I think so it's, it's a new paradigm. And it's <coughs> going to so what did you mean when you, when you said um, in the future they might need, need it? What, is it? what do you see um, we will have? Um, well, I agree with Dominic. There are many compelling applications uh, of fully decentralized blockchains. I just um, haven't had anyone come to me. I mean, I can, I, I can also say what I think some of them are, but I think I mean, you asked of the people coming to me, how many do I think really need that solution? And my answer is no. And, and going forward, uh, what do you think is the, the, the area where blockchain is really going to make a difference? What customers are you hoping to be serving going forward, making a difference, and that actually have a no need to use blockchain? Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm sort of more interested in the settings where we're willing to make uh, a few compromises or we're willing to loosen our requirements. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. The question. Hi, it's on that same topic. Um, we have also come across situations where we'd love to apply blockchain but can't quite justify it and there are other ways that we can go about it. So I'm just thinking about when we're talking about decentralised opportunities, is it less to do with the things that we're doing quite well now, which is in finance, and is it more about Internet of Things, living machinery, you know, on location, solving for transport, et cetera, et cetera. Sarah, so you want to add to that? Um, I mean, the Internet of Things is a very general term, so I don't know if I can really, you know, fully answer your question. If I can be more specific if you like. So let's talk about, for example, transportation or in the mining area or places like that where you can preemptively know a decentralized database that specific types of transport may be about to fail or due for upgrade etc cetera, etc cetera, those kinds of things like is this an area where blockchain could more effectively take off um, I mean I guess it could on the one hand if I mean with the internet of things you're typically talking about sort of devices talking to other devices and if all of those devices were produced by the same manufacturer or they all have some kind of way of authenticating themselves to each other. Um, and if, or if you don't, say, need to audit what the devices are saying to each other. Okay, so when I, because I'm working at IoT uh, in IBM, and the actual point where you want to have the blockchain is when you go from an untrusted to a trusted situation. When you have unknown devices in an untrusted um, environment, then what you can use the blockchain for is the very first step to enable the marketplace and go from an untrusted, unknown situation into a situation where you don't need trust, actually, but can have negotiations. And then what happens after that between the devices is not actually going to go over the blockchain. So would that be, for example, two different manufacturers who have compatible exactly. technology? Exactly. I mean, especially the IoT, uh, the yeah. IoT space is extremely fractured. Also, technically, it's extremely hard there to, get to find mm -hmm. a consensus. And that's, in the end, just costing the consumer. So you're talking, sorry, I won't talk for too long. You were talking in the previous conversation around um, these parallel worlds, and it's sounding to me more and more like one of the applications for blockchain is actually in this um, real world meets technology state, perhaps possibly through connected devices and transportation, etc. Would that be fair? Yeah. yeah. Can I? Yes. Yes. So I think the um, way we should think about these things is that you know something like Ethereum provides an open platform for computation. And it, it provides an open platform because firstly, there's no intermediary. And secondly, we don't have to trust that our code will execute correctly and process our data correctly. And that's why it's called trustless. Uh, which is, which, so, so there are lots of cases where this provides huge opportunities commercially. So if you look at, uh, for example, the financial world, you know, currently you know, there's 196 regulatory regimes around the world and there isn't really a, a very good global financial layer. Do we have and one last question? Yeah. Yes, please. We're going to have one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, 
time wise. Sorry. Like, um, what are your views on uh, Bitcoin XT and whether it is forking? <laughs> Peter, you want to answer that? Yeah, I just came back from an entire conference on that. I think what's probably most interesting about Bitcoin XT is it shows how structurally the Bitcoin system does require consensus and does make it very difficult to force through changes. You know, currently, as much as you have, you know, companies worth probably hundreds of millions of dollars in total trying to go push for Bitcoin XT adoption, if you actually look at the metric by which this can be measured, which is hashing power, it's about 0.1%, because you have a large group of people, including the people with hashing power, who think Bitcoin XT is a really dumb idea, and they just don't adopt it, and nothing happens. You know, I can't go force you to run software you don't want to run. And unless you get the entire ecosystem running that software, okay. So in closing, you running. in closing again, you're talking about a consensus of the actual people behind it, right? In this case, it's exactly okay. It. Thank you very much. It was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dominic. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Vlad.